Hi, and welcome back to the final part of Project Fairy by Jacqueline Wilson, continuing from chapter 15. After a full five minutes, I heard a tiny scampering underneath my bed, and then the slightest rustle as a very small someone climbed back inside the slipper. I shot out of bed and grabbed it. I couldn't see in the dark, but I felt Bindweed's long curls and her little green cap. You hid from her, I said. Of course I did, she said, coughing. It's very dusty behind your bed. I dare say I'm filthy dirty now, when I always take such pains to stay pristine. I demand a bath in rainwater, but I'm so exhausted I'd probably drown in it. How dare you betray me? It was just so that Mum could take us to that big cemetery. I was trying to help, and I made Mum promise not to tell, I protested. She wouldn't ever break a promise. You broke your promise to me, said Bindweed. I have a good mind to teach you a lesson. You all will feel very silly if I magic a great big wart on the end of your nose. Please don't, I said. I'm very tempted, said Bindweed, but it would take the little strength I have left. I was only trying to help you, I said. Then if you really want to help me, get back out of bed and take me to this cemetery now, Bindweed commanded. I can't take you now in the middle of the night. There aren't any buses for a start, and I don't have a card for a fare anyway. Plus it's scary in the dark, I said. I like the dark, said Bindweed. I can't bear that bright light your mother switched on. What sort of mother tries to blind you? She's the best mother in the world, I said hotly. You must have thought you had the best father in the world if you wanted to see him so badly, says Bindweed. You'll be telling me that the girl, that girl Kathy is the best child in all the world next. Mum is the best mother. I do wish you'd let her see, see you. It would have meant so much to her, I said. Really? I think she'd be disappointed. I'm not at my best at the moment, said Bindweed, running her pointy fingers through her bedraggled curls, then trying to fluff out her waxy white dress, which was now very crumpled and grubby. Anyway, I don't remotely resemble those dinky figurines decked around your home. They're her idea of fairy folk. Tell me more about real fairies, I said, reaching down and picking up the slipper. I flew it up, up onto the bed as if it was a toy aeroplane and settled it beside me on the pillow. She told me more about fairies and goblins and silkies and boggets. I wanted to get up and take further notes for my project, but I was getting very sleepy now. I couldn't keep my eyes, eyes open any longer. I dreamed of all these weird, magical creatures and woke with a start as a small unicorn leapt on me and started stamping on my chest with its hard hooves. I tried to fight back and discovered it was only Fido banging me with his wheels. Woof, woof, wake up, Mabe. I'm hungry. I want a big juicy bone, Robin made him say. Hey, watch out, Fido. You're too rough, I said, pushing him away. He just wants attention, silly old Fido, said Robin, letting him fall back onto the floor. Budge up, Mabe. I want to cuddle. Hey, why have you got your old slipper in your pillow? Shall I chuck it on the floor too? No, careful. I snatched it from him, catching a glimpse of bindweed diving downwards into its depths, a tiny flurry of green and white. What's that fluttering thing? Is it an insect? Robin asked, flicking his finger at the slipper. Stop it, you'll hurt it, I said, holding the slipper out of his reach. It's only Nibbles. Is Nibbles a real mouse? Robin asked. What do you think? I replied, putting the slipper safely out of his reach on my bedside table. I can't always tell what's real and what's not, said Robin. Let me see if you're real, I said, and I started tickling him. He wriggled and squirmed, shrieking with laughter. Shh, you'll wake Mum. Is she having a lie-in? I asked. Yes, she's snoring, said Robin. I wanted to wake up soon because I want my breakfast and so does Fido. I'll make breakfast, I said. I decided to make Mum a special birthday breakfast, even though it wasn't her birthday for ages. I made the lovely strawberry jam heart sandwiches. They were a little lopsided, but I put the best shaped one on Mum's plate. I also fished out a strawberry from the jam pot and put it on a 20 pence piece that hopefully looked like a little silver platter. I served this up to Bindweed while Robin was trying hard to spoon a strawberry out for himself, and then we gave Mum her breakfast on a tray. Her eyes still looked a bit puffy, but they shone when she saw her special breakfast. Bless you, darlings, she said, sitting up and smiling. Are you trying to bribe me, Mabe? I'm sorry, but we're still not going on another long bus journey today. If you want to look at gravestones, why don't we go and look in a churchyard around here? I thought about the church down the road and round the corner. We'd been there once when they'd had a summer fete. It was a very plain building, rather like a little school. It had a patch of grass at the front, but I couldn't remember any flowers or any gravestones either, come to that. You mean the church just along from the post office, I asked. No, lovey, it's too modern. But there's an old church near my supermarket. It's got a big graveyard, but it's all a bit of tangle now. All over ivy, said Mum, eating her jam sandwich. And bindweed? I asked, trying to sound casual. Oh, there's lots of weeds, said Mum. It doesn't look as if they're, they've had a gardener around for donkey's years. I don't think people go there much nowadays. Excellent, I said. You're a funny sausage, said Mum, shaking her head at me. 
If Mabes a sausage, then Fido wants to eat her all up, said Robin, hauling his dog up onto Mum's bed. Hey, hey, careful. You'll spill my tea pet, said Mum. That sounds funny, like I'm a tea pet, like a teapot, but maybe I've got a tail instead of a handle and I eat with my spout, said Robin, laughing. You two are the weirdest kids in the world, said Mum, but she laughed too. We always had a cuddle in Mum's bed after breakfast on a Sunday. Mum would sometimes make up a story for us. We'd talk about something we'd seen on television. Mum would tell us tales about when she was a little girl. She had very strict old-fashioned parents who sometimes smacked her. Her mother tied her hair into plaits so tight she couldn't frown, and she wasn't allowed ribbons, only elastic bands. I couldn't help being glad that Granny and Grandpa weren't around anymore. She didn't just tell tales about herself. She would tell us stories about Dad when he was a little boy, and how he was always a free spirit and loved nature and animals and played music. She would remind us of the times he'd taken us for walks in the countryside and tamed birds so they landed on his hand and played any tune we fancied on his penny whistle. I wasn't sure whether I could remember Dad doing this or not, but Mum used to make it all seem real. Maybe it had been real, maybe it hadn't. This morning Mum didn't mention Dad, and we didn't either. I did think about him though, wondering if he was cuddling up in bed with his new partner and her daughter and their little son. It gave me a funny pain inside. Have you got a tummy ache, Mabe? Mum asked. Sort of, I said. It feels empty. I feel a bit empty too, said Robin. Let's have another breakfast. I wasn't really feeling a really hungry emptiness, but it seemed a good idea at the time. Mum started to get out of bed, but I pushed her gently back on the pillows. No, I'll make it, Mum. I want to, I said. It gave me a chance to go and check in on bindweed. The strawberry had been bigger than her head, but she'd eaten it all up. She looked as if she'd been garishly made up, with streaks of crimson smeared over her cheeks and around her mouth. She smacked her small lips appreciatively. You have kept me supplied with regular meals, some of which were scarcely edible, though I know you meant well. But this delectable strawberry is the finest I have ever eaten. Even Wentworth strawberries weren't as sweet as this one. Thank you very much, dear Mabe, she said. It was the most grateful she had ever been, and I was very touched. Perhaps you'd like another, I suggested. Oh, please, she said. Please, please, please. I took a sticky 20 pence platter and dug deep into the jam jar until I managed to find another strawberry. Bliss, said Bindweed, waving her sticky hands and wriggling with joy. My slipper was going to need a good scrubbing, but I didn't really mind. I felt so fond of her now that I wished I could keep her with me forever. But she was very pale underneath the strawberry smears. I knew I had to let her go. I can't be sure, but I think I've found you a new home, I said. Mum says there's a graveyard nearby that's very quiet and overgrown. It sounds as if it could be exactly the right place. We'll go there today and you can see what you think, though you'll have to have a good bath first. I decided it would be simplest if Bindweed joined me in my own bath. She wasn't sure she could swim, and she didn't want to get her wings wet anyway, so she rode on Robin's toy duck, sailing backwards and forwards around me while I washed myself. She trailed her hands in my soapy water and carefully washed herself, her hair and her dress, and soon she looked spotless, though very pale, and her limbs were as spindly as a spider's now. Oh dear, you've got so thin, I said anxiously, peering at her. Yes, I definitely need feeding up, said Bindweed, holding out her arms in front of her. Perhaps I might have another nibble on a strawberry. I don't think there are any left in the jar, I said, but I could have another scrape around just in case, or fix you a thimbleful of the strawberry jelly part. That sounds very tempting, but then I dare say I'd need to take another ride on the strange duck. Its feathers are ill-defined and it's got very silly features, but at least it doesn't deafen when it's with its quacking, said Bindweed. The ducks on the lake at Wentworth were tremendously noisy, and the swans were exceedingly bad-tempered. A young fairy I knew tried to pluck a few small feathers to make a cloak for herself one very cold winter, and the swan stuck her such a blow with its wing that she limped badly ever afterwards and couldn't rise even an inch in the air. It was very tragic. She shook her head, tutting. We fairies do best if we avoid all wildlife. Are you absolutely sure you want to live outside, then? Wouldn't you be safer staying here with me? We aren't allowed any kind of pets in our flat. Well, Robin's got Fido, but he's not real. And I could make you your own little winter cloak. I could pull a few feathers out of my last year's puffer coat. Plus, feed you strawberries every day, I suggested, trying to tempt her. Bindweed looked a little wistful, but she shook her head. I can't speak for all the fairies. I believe some species thrive in glass conservatories, but we bindweeds are wild. Cannot last long indoors in captivity. I shall soon start to droop beyond revival. Yet, you survived being shut up in my fairy book for years and years and years, I said. I was crushed into hibernation. I was in a deep sleep for all that time, dead to the world. Bindweeds are used to this process. We die back in winter, but our roots are tenacious. We spring up again, and again and again. Ask any gardener, said Bindweed, smiling. Oh, how the Wentworth gardeners used to curse us. 
Well, it doesn't sound as if there are any gardeners at this churchyard, I said. Mum says it's all covered in ivy. Bindweed sniffed. Oh dear, it sounds as if I shall be slumming it. Those ivies are so coarse and common. Still, I am so lonely now I feel I could even embrace a beastly nettle fairy. I couldn't help feeling hurt. I tried my hardest to be Bindweed's friend, but I clearly didn't count. Well, let's hope you can find a few wild roses to choke in the cemetery, I said huffily. Oh yes, please, said Bindweed. Let's go there immediately. I put her in my pocket without further ado and went to ask Mum. I think we'd better wait till later. They could be having a morning service at the church. It would look rude if we were poking around the gravestones while they were inside praying, said Mum. It would be better if we went after lunch. Bindweed was doing some little poking inside my pocket. Her fingers were tiny but very sharp and my tummy was tender. Ouch, I said, wincing. I don't think anyone would mind. They might think we were visiting a relative. We could look very sad and holy. I don't see why it's so urgent, lovey, said Mum. Can't we just relax and loaf about this morning? I was thinking I might branch out and try to make a cake for tea. What sort do you fancy? A big cake with lots of jam, Robin suggested. Well, I'm not sure there's much left, said Mum, peering in the jar. What about little fairy cakes with icing on the top? Good plan, said Robin. Ooh, I think I like making cakes. Mum look, looked up a recipe on the internet and started getting all the ingredients out of the cupboard. I wanted to see if I had any further pokes in the stomach, but Bindweed was still. I pretended I needed to go to the bathroom so we could have a private conversation. Fairy cakes, she said. Cakes specially for fairies? Well, I suppose they could be. They're little cakes, though they'd seem enormous to you. I think they're very yummy, but I don't know whether you'd like them. They look very pretty, though. You can sprinkle them with hundreds and thousands. Hundreds and thousands of what? Bindweed asked. Tiny little sweets, all different colours, I said. Or you can decorate them with small silver balls. They taste good too. And I know, gla gla cherries. I think you'd like them very much. Maybe as much as strawberries. Would you like to stay and try one? Perhaps I would, she said, licking her little lips. If you promise we can go to the graveyard this afternoon with no more per prevaricating. I wasn't sure what that meant. You really needed a dictionary handy when you had a conversation with a fairy. Still, I got Mum to promise that we would definitely go to the graveyard straight after lunch. I suggested that Bindweed might like to take a nap in my slipper, but she said she was far too excited to sleep. She wanted to amuse herself exploring the living room, while Mum and Robin and I were busy mixing and stirring in the kitchen. I imagined her peering at each fairy ornament scornfully, maybe trying out the little toadstool chairs and the small swing. She might try to get into the fairy house, though I knew the door was stuck fast. I'd had, to lu had no luck trying to poke a tiny fairy doll inside. I couldn't see her when I popped back later into the, into the living room, when the cakes were in the oven. Bindweed, I called softly. It's safe to come out. Mum and Robin are doing the washing up in the kitchen. I'd left Robin standing on a chair at the sink, a tea towel wrapped around his waist, pretending the spoons were sharks, while Mum obligingly made her fingers into people desperately trying to escape. There was a lot of splashing going on, and it would take a while to mop themselves and the kitchen floor. I looked around the room. Many pairs of fairy eyes stared back at me, but none were big and green and sparkling and real. Bindweed, don't play hide and seek with me, I said. I'm not deliberately hiding, and you're useless at seeking, she hissed, though I still couldn't spot her. Where are you? I said, peering round and round. Here, in this wretched travesty of a house, Bindweed hissed. The door was still glued shut on the fairy house, but when I peered through the little latticed window, I saw her glowering inside, sitting cross-legged on the tiny crocheted rug. My goodness, there you are, I said. Oh, you look so sweet. Stop mocking me. Get me out at once, she commanded. Why can't you get out the same way you got in, I asked trying the door again in vain. I managed to prise open one of those clumsy windows, but when I squeezed through, the window snapped shut, very nearly chopping my feet off as it did so. And now I can't get it open again, and I'm trapped. This is the most uncomfortable dwelling in the world. It's all fake. You can't get on into the bed because the sheets are made of plaster. You can't wash in the sink because the little taps don't turn. You can't hang your dress in the wardrobe because the door doesn't open either. Get me out at once, Bindweed demanded. I divvied, circling the house, wondering how on earth I was going to do that. Do hurry up, I'm becoming increasingly claustrophobic, Bindweed said. I guess this wasn't a good thing. I tried to puzzle it out. I saw the little window where she'd got in and saw she'd attacked it, attacked it with Mum's nail file, slightly buckling both. I had, to get, had to go myself and managed to get it open again, though it would only stay that way if I stuck my finger in. Can you squeeze out now, I asked. Quickly, because it's digging right into my finger and it doesn't half hurt. How can I squeeze out when your finger's totally blocking my exit? Bindweed grumbled, but she gave it a try. She climbed up and along my finger, squashing herself paper flat when she got to the gap, and after several frantic wriggles, just managed it. 
The window snapped shut on my finger. I, sti I stifled a scream, gritted my teeth and eased it out. Oh, that hurts so. Look, I'm bleeding, I said, examining my throbbing finger. That's only a slight scratch, said Bindweed dismissively, in between taking great gulps of air. And the window's got a bit more broken now. Look, I said worriedly. Bindweed shrugged. Well, it wasn't made properly, was it? She said. How can you be so heartless? Mum loves this little fairy house, I said. It's easy. I don't have a heart, said Bindweed. Of course you do. Everyone has a heart. It's what makes the blood go round your body, I said. I don't have any blood either. I have sap, said Bindweed. She put her hand out and rubbed her wrist on the jagged edge of the window. Don't do that, I said, snatching her hand away. She'd managed to cut it slightly. As I stared, a tiny drop of sticky white liquid oozed out of the little wound. See? Sap, said Bindweed, in a superior fashion. It really was sap, that white sticky stuff that seeps out when you cut a flower stem. I stared at her in shock. She really was a different species altogether. She wasn't a miniature child with stuck on wings. She was an ancient little alien from fairyland. Anyway, I'm sure it doesn't do you any good to cut yourself. You could probably leak to death. And don't get up to any more mischief, I said, trying to sound stern. It was difficult giving a scolding to someone about 20 times my age. Bindweed took no notice anyway. She was sniffing, her pointy nose twitching. What's that delightful smell? she asked. I sniffed too. I think the cakes are ready to come out of the oven. They do smell delicious, Bindweed conceded. I'm rather peckish after all that drama. You have to wait till tea time, I said. But I won't be here at your tea time, said Bindweed. I will hopefully be removed to my new dwelling. Oh, well, I'll see whether Mum will let me have just one for pudding now, I said. Then I can share it with you. Bindweed looked at me, rubbing her wrist. You're an obliging child, she said. It was very scant praise, but I couldn't help glowing. Chapter 16 It always seems like ages waiting for cakes to get cold enough to decorate. Robin kept poking them to see if they were still warm. I don't see why we can't start decorating. I don't mind if the icing goes all runny. I like it when the butter melts into my toast, he said. You have to wait for cakes to cool, I said. You have to wait for cakes to cool, because that's the rule, Robin sang. Hey, do you like my song? I just made it up all by myself, and it rhymes too. He sang it over and over again until Mum and I felt like screaming, but it was such a silly, catchy tune, we found ourselves singing it as we made the icing. Mum had specially bought some little bottles of food colouring. They were red and yellow and blue. I think pink would be a lovely colour for fairy cake, said Mum. We could put a tiny drop of red in the icing sugar and mix it carefully. They'd look pretty, studded with little silver balls. That's too girly, said Robin, talking out of the side of his mouth in a bad imitation of Mickey. We could make pale blue icing too. Would you like that, Robin? Robin considered. I want mine to be yellow. Bright yellow, he said. Oh, like the sun, said Mum, smiling. That's a lovely idea. No, like emojis, said Robin. I'm going to do this, this winky one. I can make the face out of those coloured chocolate buttons. That's very inventive, though not very fairy-like, said Mum. But you do whatever you want, pet. What do you want to do, maid? We don't have any green colouring, do we? Well, why would anyone want to make a green cake, said Mum. I want to, I said. Well, just on one of my cakes to see what it looks like. Hey, I could mix a little drop of yellow and a little drop of blue, and then the icing would come out green, wouldn't it? I suppose so, said Mum doubtfully. But it would look a bit weird, more like a witchy cake than a fairy cake. Well, it doesn't matter, does it? I asked. You're letting Robin have an emoji cake, and that's weird too, isn't it? I suppose I've got to face it. I've got two very weird children, said Mum. She frowned as she mixed the icing in her bowl, biting her bottom lip. Mum, I said. It's all right. We can have plain white icing if you'd rather. No, darling. You can decorate your cakes any way you like. I was just thinking, though. Maybe I've gone over the top with all my pretty fairy things, said Mum. She glanced around the kitchen at the flower fairy tea towel and tray and the Margaret Tarrant fairy pictures she'd bought at a car boot sale. Maybe I'm the weird one. No, you're not. You're only saying that because Dad mentioned it yesterday. He was just being mean. It's lovely that you like fairies, I declared. And I like fairies. In fact, the minute I finish decorating my cake, I'm going to put on my lovely fairy dress. And I like fairies too, said Robin. I'd quite like a fairy dress when it's my birthday. And Fido wants one too, though I'm not sure how I could dress him up in it because his wheels get in the way. Robin is definitely weird, but the great thing is he doesn't care. He's actually very creative. He made four bright yellow emoji cakes, one smiling, one winking, one sleeping, and one devil one with two little horns made out of slices of chocolate. Mum made four pink fairy cakes sprinkled with silver balls in hundreds and thousands. I made four green fairy cakes. I decorated three with pink chocolate buttons. The fourth had little blobs of cream cheese on it, on top. I hope they look like white flowers. 
and then I made leaves with thin slices of cucumber. Yuck, said Robin, wrinkling his nose. You don't put cheese and cucumber on cake? It's a special savoury cake, I said. It's very, uh, inventive, said Mum. Well, we're all going to have a lovely tea. Mum, do you think we could possibly have one now as a special treat? It's such a long wait to wait until tea time. Please, please, I begged. All right then, said Mum, just one. Yay, said Robin, reaching for his winky emoji cake. Thanks, I said, picking up my savoury cake. I'm just going to change into my fairy dress now. I dashed into the living room, found Bindweed tweaking the snub noses of three little fairy dolls, popped her in my pocket and carried her off to my bedroom. Why did you stop me having fun with those hideous dollies? Bindweed complained. Because I've brought you a special fairy cake, I said. Look. I set the cake down on my bedside table and stood Bindweed beside it. She looked at it, but didn't say anything. Her head was bent, her long curls hiding her face. I know it looks a bit weird, but it's, it's meant to be a picture of Bindweed. All the white blobs are flowers made out of cream cheese and the leafy bits are cucumber because I know you like the taste. Still, it's probably odd to put it on a cake. You don't have to eat it if you don't want. I know you're very picky about your food, I said awkwardly. She looked up at me. Her eyes were very green and shiny. It's a beautiful cake, she said. I love it. You made it specially for me. Yes, it's a goodbye cake, I said. Try a bit. She bent forward and took a nibble at the edge. Mmm, she said, her mouth full. She swallowed and took another bite, and then another, and another, circling round the cake. It is delicious. I don't think she particularly liked the cake itself, but she certainly seemed to be appreciating the topping. I put on my fairy dress, fluffing out the skirts. It still looked ridiculous, and I was worried about people staring at me when I went outside, but I felt I needed to wear it. I sat on my bed and watched Bindweed circling her cake. She went in and out of focus because my eyes were a bit watery. I knew I was going to miss her terribly. I didn't go and hang out with Robin and Mum, though they called to me. I told them I was busy working on my project. It was actually more or less finished, though I'd left a few gaps in the pages for pictures. I settled down to drawing now, and when Bindweed sat down at last for a bit of a rest, I attempted a portrait of her. Wait, she said, arranging her curls and straightening her cap. I must look a sight, and I seem to have become a little sticky. Perhaps I need another duck ride. You look fine just the way you are, I said. Just try to keep still. I've been squashed flat for many years, said Bindweed. I don't ever want to be still again. She stood up, walked to the edge of my table, and then went on walking in thin air. She started somersaulting rapidly downwards. I gasped, breaking the point of my pencil as I rushed to catch her, but she flapped her wings and soared upwards, circling my head. Bindweed, stop teasing me, I said, snatching at her, but she kept darting just out of reach. She seemed full of energy now, though she'd been so weak before. Clearly the cream cheese and cucumber had been good for her. She flew all the way up to the ceiling, turned herself upside down, and walked across it jauntily. Can't catch me, she called down at me. I abandoned my portrait, found another pencil, and tried to sketch her rapid flight. But she was quicker than any butterfly, and it was almost impossible. She cried out triumphantly, and then attempted somersaulting in the air, whirling around and round rapidly. But then she faltered. She did her best to straighten out, but her wings stayed limp, and she started falling rapidly. I caught her just before she hit the carpet, and cradled her in my hands. She lay there, quivering. Bindweed, are you all right? I asked anxiously. Of course I am, she whispered. Of course you're not, I said. You've exhausted yourself with all that showing off. I felt so much better, she said. I went dizzy for a moment. Well, no wonder. You, you can't dart all over the place, not after being squashed flat for so long. You have to take it easy, I said. I don't think you're ready to live by yourself yet, I added hopefully. Of course I am, she in insisted. Well, I think you should stay with me another couple of days, perhaps a week or so, just till you're absolutely fighting fit, I said. She shook her head firmly, her curls tickling my fingers. I sighed. All right, then. But you'd better have a proper rest now, so you've got your strength back by this afternoon, I said. And this time she nodded. I tucked her up in the slipper, put it in the dark under my bed, and crept out of my bedroom. I wanted to spend every minute playing with her now, but she was determined to leave me. But I knew she really did need to take it easy. I spent the rest of the morning with Mum and Robin playing an ancient game of snakes and ladders that we'd found at a car boot sale. It was fun to play, but I stay, stayed feeling anxious, wondering how Bindweed was going to cope in the future. What if she faltered and went dizzy when a hawk or a buzzard were flying overhead? What if she was sunbathing in the grass and a rabbit nibbled her green booties? What if she fell down a badger hole and was mistaken for a tasty snack? I was so worried now I could barely eat my lunch, even though it was chicken and roast potatoes. There, I shouldn't have let you eat that cake, said Mum. I hadn't eaten so much as a crumb of it, but I couldn't tell Mum that. No, 
It's just that my tummy feels a bit funny, I said truthfully. I'd feel funny if I'd eaten a bright green cake, said Robin, but my emoji cake was absolutely yummy. Can I have another one for pudding, Mum? There won't be any left for tea at this rate, said Mum, but she let them, let him take one out of the tin. She pulled me onto her lap and gave me a cuddle as if I was as little as Robin. What's up, pet? she said softly, rubbing my tummy. I just feel a bit sad, I said. You're thinking about Dad, aren't you? Mum said softly. No, no, I'm not, I said, but Mum didn't seem to believe me. It's only natural to feel sad that he's got a new family now, said Mum. I don't feel sad about Dad. Well, I do a bit, but it's not that, it's... I know, said Mum. She didn't know, but it was still very comforting to be held on her lap and cuddled. Then Robin wanted to get in on the cuddle and clambered into Mum's lap too, clutching Fido, so it was a terrible squash. Watch Fido's wheels, I warned Robin. I don't want them tearing my fairy dress. I'm so glad you like it, Mabe, said Mum. I was worried you might feel you were too old for dressing up. I love it, I said, although the thought of going out in it and everyone staring made my tummy churn more. It was a really warm, sunny day too, so I couldn't hide it with a coat. But it wasn't as much of an ordeal as I'd feared. When we set out for the graveyard, a lot of people who were out for Sunday strolls smiled when they saw me, but not in a mocking, sneery way. Someone's going to a party, said a lady with rosy cheeks. Have, lovely, have a lovely time, dear. A little girl about Robin's age tugged at her mum's arm and said, Look at that girl in the fairy dress. Oh, I want one just like that. A granddad gave me a little bow as if I was royalty and said, Make way for the fairy princess. Bindweed was tucked down my satin bodice. She didn't make a sound, but I could feel her laughing. Robin looked at me closely. Your dress is moving, he said. I've got nibbles scrabbling about inside, I said. Shh, don't tell mum. Robin gave me an elaborate emoji wink. Your secret's safe with me, he hissed out of the side of his mouth. I kept a careful eye where we were going. I knew this route towards mum's supermarket. When we got to it, mum had a quick glance inside the door. Are you looking out for Mr Henry, I asked. No, I'm just... Seeing what's going on, said Mum. I'm not even sure he comes in on a Sunday. And then she suddenly gave a little wave. I peered inside too and saw him standing there, looking smart in a blue shirt and cream trousers. He was waving too. Hello, he said, coming to the door and smiling at all of us. Are you going up to town again? No, we're going to a graveyard where the dead people live, said Robin. Really, said Mr Henry. It's Mabe. She wants to study the gravestones in the church down that little lane, said Mum. I suppose it sounds a bit morbid. Not at all. I like looking at gravestones too. The old ones are really interesting, said Mr. Henry. He looked over his shoulder at the checkouts. We're not very busy at the moment, and I haven't taken a lunch break. Do you mind if I come along too? Well, said Mum, going bright pink. I stared at her. I couldn't read her expression. Was she horrified or thrilled? She wavered while we all waited. Mum looked around at each of us and then back to me. Uh, it's up to Mabe, she said. Up to me? It's all your idea going to see the gravestone, said Mum. It was mean of her to make me say yes or no. I couldn't say no right into Mr Henry's face. It would look so rude. But maybe it would be easier to slope off and rehome Bindweed if Mum was distracted by Mr Henry. I shrugged. OK, yes, do come, I said. Mr Henry grinned at me. He had a lovely smile. I could see why he made Mum go pink. She was smiling back. Robin was frowning. Ooh, he said, pouting. I sense an objection, said Mr Henry, looking at Robin with his head to one side. Mum gave Robin's hand a little shake. It's not me, Robin said quickly. I don't mind, it's Fido. He doesn't like strangers. He pretended Fido was making little growly noises. Mr Henry laughed. Oh, that's easily overcome. I keep a packet of dog treats in my pocket. He felt around, brought out a totally invisible packet, delved in for an imaginary treat and held out his hand to Fido's old woolly mouth. Woof, 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 he said, pretending Fido was galloping and golloping the treat. Fido doesn't talk like that, said Robin sternly. So how does Fido talk, said Mr Henry. He says, woof, woof, go away. I don't like strangers, said Robin. Robin, don't be so rude, said Mum. Mr Henry laughed. Well, I'll have to try extra hard with him. because Perhaps you could uh, put in a good word for me, Robin. Robin was wrong-footed. He couldn't work out what to say, so he stuck out his tongue instead. Mum looked agonised. Robin, that's so naughty, she said. Whatever will Mr Henry think? Mr Henry seemed to think it funny. He stuck out his own tongue and waggled it at Robin. Mr Henry, said Mum. Robin pulled his worst face, wrinkling his nose and pulling his jaw sideways. Mr Henry pulled an even worse face, making his eyes pop and his mouth entirely disappear. Oh, Robin shrieked. Oh, that's so hideous. Show me how you do it. Mr Henry showed him and then pulled another face, this time practically turning into a gargoyle. Robin shrieked with laughter. Mr Henry did too. They pulled faces all the way to the graveyard, obviously firm friends now. 
You must stop pulling faces now. It's not respectful, said Mum, as we went through the little cast iron gate to the churchyard. Yes, Mum, said Robin. Yes, Mum, said Mr Henry, which made Robin burst out laughing again. Mum sighed. Ah, you too, she said, but she was only pretending to be cross. She came up close to me. I'm sorry if they're spoiling your outing, Maeve. You feel free to wander around and have a good look at everything, okay, darling? She whispered. It was more than okay. While Mum and Mr Henry and Robin looked at gravestones at the front of the church, I slipped around the side to the back. It was darker here, shaded by a huge old yew tree that had spread itself widely until it took up half the room. There were really old gravestones, so yellowed with lichen that I couldn't read the writing on them. There were sepulchres too, that like little stone houses. The really old ones had great cracks in their sides. They looked as if a skeleton might stick a bony arm through the gap. Some graves were just grassy tussocks outlined with crumbling brick, though others were grand with marble columns, and there were several angels with their wings permanently spread watching over us. The grass grew almost up to my knees in this part, so I had to wade through it. The path to the bolted church door was mossy, and the unkempt grass around the graves was thick with buttercups and daisies but there was no sign of any bindweed on the grey flint walls surrounding the graveyard. I could feel bindweed being tumbled this way and that by my knee action. She struggled until she got her head out of my pocket, and then she gave a little cry. She pointed urgently with one small finger towards the thick hedge at the back. Most of it was threaded with dark green ivy, but there were a few delicate strands of paler green too, and big flowers with white waxy petals. Bindweed? I whispered, my heart thudding. Bindweed, she agreed and she scrambled right out of my pocket and flew to the hedge. I followed her, tripping here and there, but I didn't dare take my eyes off her. She was there at the hedge, flying from flower to flower, and when I got close up I saw she had tears running down her pale cheeks. She was calling, delving here and there, clutching the long strands of winding stem. "'Where are you, my sisters?' she cried. "'Bind weeds! Please come and greet me!' "'You won't find any hedge bindweed fairies. They died out years ago,' said a husky voice." and a second small winged person flew out of the tangled ivy that was choking the hedge. Another fairy. It seemed to be a male, a little taller than Bindweed, a much stockier, with brownish skin and yellow hair in tight curls that stood out around his head. He had scaly dark, screen, sc dark green wings, the exact shade of the ivy surrounding him. You're an ivy fairy, I said. He hovered in the air for a moment, staring at me in shock, and then dived into the hanging clumps of ivy. It's all right, there's no need to be frightened of her. She won't hurt you, said Bindweed scornfully. She's my girl. I felt my heart thumping. She called me her girl again. I thrust his ye Ivy thrust his yellow curls out of the tangled growth. He peered at me fearfully. Bindweed's right. Uh, of course I won't hurt you, I whispered. I held up my hand to try to reassure him, but he dodged away. You can't catch me, he said. I don't want to, I replied. Of course she doesn't, said Bindweed. What would she want with a common Ivy? I'd sooner be a common ivy than a practically extinct bindweed, said Ivy, jumping from leaf to leaf and then turning a somersault in front of her. Practically, said bindweed. Well, there are a couple of little field bindweeds creeping out about here and there, though they mostly all got stamped on years ago, said Ivy. There are little bindweeds here, still. Where are you, my sisters? Bindweed cried, flying down to the ground and searching frantically in the long grass. Bindweeds! Bindweeds! Something scurried between my feet. One, two, three tiny fairies, pink and white with stubby little wings that only lifted them a few inches in the air. They held hands even when they were flying. My own kinfolk, said Bindweed, had one remove of course. Don't get too excited. They're a timid little bunch, no fun whatsoever, said Ivy. Bindweed held out her arms to the tiny pink fairies. They hesitated, looking at each other unsure. I'm a Bindweed, said Bindweed. Can't you see that? Come here, you little sillies, and let me hug you. It's so wonderful to see relatives, albeit lowly ones. I didn't think her wise to start insulting them when they'd only just met, but they didn't seem to mind. They tottered forward in their funny little pink booties, and Bindweed enveloped them in her arms, hugging them tight. You dear little girl, she said. The smallest one wriggled free. I'm not a girl, it said indignantly. I'm a boy. Dear little girls and, and boy, said Bindweed. So, do you have special names? They shook their heads. Then how shall I tell you apart, said Bindweed. She dismantled the hug and lined them up in size order. The tallest came up to her waist. The middle one was hip size. The little one, the little boy, only reached her knees. He started sucking his thumb anxiously. You can be Pinky, said Bindweed, pointing to the biggest. And you can be Twinky. And the baby can be Dinky. I'm not a baby either, said the smallest, taking his thumb out of his mouth. So 
There are four of us bindweeds, though I, of course, am a superior hedge variety. Look at my beautiful big white flowers, said bindweed, gesturing. She flew up to Ivy. So I rather think we bindweeds outnumber you, Ivy. Oh, you do, do you, said Ivy. He put his fingers in his mouth and gave a piercing whistle. Yellow curly heads poked out all over the place. In the hedge, up the trees, across the gravestones, there was a whole colony of ivy fairies. Bindweed did her best not to look overawed. My goodness, you sturdy survivors, she said in a queenly fashion. Oh well, I suppose I'll have to put up with a few neighbours, but no carousing at, at night, if you please. Come little fieldies, let us find a suitable home together. She took hold of Pinky's hand, who linked fingers with Twinkie, while Dinky clutched her desperately, and they all flew upwards, feet kicking. Bindweed popped the three small fairies into the largest white flower, though its petals were a little overblown. She chose the choicest flower for herself, a perfect dazzling beauty, and she nestled into it daintily, giving a little wriggle of delight. Oh, the joy of having a fresh, fragrant, fragrant bed at last, she said. Was she suggesting my slipper wasn't fresh and fragrant? I felt hurt, though I could just see how Bindweed blended into the flower so that she was scarcely visible. Do you think this is the right home for you at last, Bindweed? I asked. I spoke softly, but at the sound of my voice, the three field Bindweeds squealed in terror and all the ivies dived back into their secret dens, though the first one hung in the air, hands on hips, to try to look bold. I think it is, she said. She lowered her own voice. It's not the most selective areas, but maybe some of my sisters might be tempted to take up residence here when I've colonised it successfully. I will content myself with the three little ones for the moment, though they seem lacking in sap. I bent forward until I was almost touching her. And you're not overwhelmed by all these ivies, I whispered. I shall soon put them in their place, said Bindweed. They won't hurt you. Bindweed snorted. I should like to see them try. And what will you do about food and drink, I asked. There will be copious morning dew on every petal and leaf at sunrise, said Bindweed, and salads and fresh fruit and berries. You have to be very careful with berries, I said. Didn't you say some of them are poisonous? Bindweed sighed. Ah, I am almost two hundred years old than you, and my kinfolk have been on this earth since the beginning of time. We have been stamped on, trapped in cages, shot out with bows and arrows, eaten by animals, and squashed flat in books. But I have never yet heard of any fairy poisoning itself with the wrong kind of berries. All right, I was just checking, I said wounded. Mabe, Mabe, can you hear me, pet? It was Mum calling me from the side of the church. Come and have a look at this gravestone. In a minute, I called back. I hovered anxiously beside Bindweed. So, you're sure you'll be all right? I feel at home here, she said simply. Then I suppose it's time to say goodbye, I said. My throat felt so tight I was finding it difficult to speak. Goodbye, said Bindweed, with a little wave. So that was it. I turned quickly so she wouldn't see the tears in my eyes. Goodbye, I mumbled and went towards the church. Wait! It was only a little cry, but I still heard it distinctly. Bindweed, had her hands on the edge of her flower and was leaning towards me. She was wiping her eyes with the back of her hand. Bindweed, are you all right? You're not crying too, are you? I asked, running back to her. Of course I'm not crying, she said indignantly, though her eyes were as wet as mine. I simply want to say thank you for freeing me from that great book and for doing your best to look after me. I'm exceedingly grateful to you. Would you like one last wish? Oh, Bindweed, I didn't know what to wish for. I'd got my own back on Kathy, Mickey was my new best friend, I'd met up with Dad again, and I knew now that I didn't want him to come back. Hurry up, or I might change my mind, said Bindweed, though I think she was just teasing. I wish, I wish I get to see you again, I said. Bindweed raised her tiny arched eyebrows. That's easy enough. I'm sure you'll be able to persuade your mother to bring you here, and you won't mind. I don't want to disturb you, I said humbly. I think I would rather like a visit or two, now and then, when you see fit, said Bindweed. That will be lovely, I said. It will be even lovelier if you brought a cake with you occasionally, or a special sweet strawberry, said Bindweed. I'll do my best, I said. Then I held out my hand and she clutched my little finger, and we embraced in our own fashion. Goodbye, my own girl, Bindweed said huskily. Goodbye, my own dear fairy, I said. Mabe! Mum was right behind me now. Bindweed let me go and flew into the hedge, her wings flapping so far she was scarcely visible. Mum stood squinting into the sunlight. Mabe, did I just see? Am I dreaming? Can't be true, but I'm sure I just saw, she stammered, a fairy, I said, and I tugged her, hugged her tight. My Fairy Project by Mae Macclesfield. Do you believe in fairies? I'm sure nearly everyone in our class would say no. Yet if I'd asked that question when we were in reception, I think lots of you would have said yes. 
Very little children love to dress up in pink sparkly dresses and play with fairy dolls. They skip about like fairies in their ballet class. They love fairy stories and fairy films and fairy games. And nearly everyone hopes the tooth fairy will come at night and leave a coin under the pillow. But as children grow older, they slowly stop believing that fairies are real. However, some adults carry on believing in fairies. They have all sorts of pretty fairy ornaments and decorations in their homes and go to special fairy fairs. I think this is a good thing, but I think these fairies are pretend. Just like fluffy, smiley teddies aren't like real wild bears. My project is about real fairies. This is a toy fairy. This is a real fairy. There are many more flower fairies. They all like to live outdoors. They like to keep well away from human beings, us, but there are indoor fairies too. They can sew and do all kinds of tasks if they feel like it, but they can also be very naughty and play tricks. They can spoil the milk and make a mess and steal things. They're even known to tangle shoelaces. Fairies come in all different sizes too. Some can be as big as us. Some only come up to our knees, but most are very little and could sit in your hand, but they probably wouldn't want to unless they really like you. There are also fairy animals. Some are very fierce and scary like big bulls. There are dog fairies who can be scary too. There are cat fairies and even a caterpillar fairy called the gooseberry wife. There are lots of other magic creatures like elves and pixies and hobgoblins and boggarts who sound very rude and like to live in cupboards, cupboards and caves. It would be fun to meet a boggart. The queen of all the fairies is called Mabe. I'm not just saying that because it's my name, it's true. Shakespeare wrote about her in his play Romeo and Juliet. He also wrote about Queen Titania in A Midsummer Night's Dream, but I think Mabe is much more fairy-like. Titania is silly and falls in love with a man with a donkey head. Shakespeare also wrote about a hog, hog, hobgoblin called Robin Goodfellow. My brother is called Robin. Robin Goodfellow is famous for playing lots of pranks. So is my brother. There are all sorts of paintings of fairies. They were very popular in Victorian times. Some are very pretty and some are very weird. There's a painting by Richard Dadd called The Fairy Fellers Masterstroke, which makes your eyes go funny because you can't quite make out what's going on. It's as if you're peeping through the grass. If you peer really hard, you can see Queen Mabe in her fairy coach riding across the brim of a magician's hat. The fairy painter I like best is a man called John Anster, Fitzgerald. He painted a portrait of himself having a dream about fairies. It seems more like a nightmare to me because some of the fairies look like furry demons. There's one pretty lady fairy with a big purple convol convolvulus flower above her head. These flowers make you fall asleep or have funny dreams. They are like the common bindweed flowers that grow wild and like to coil their way up other plants and choke them. Bindweed fairies are very magical. If there are any fairies still living now, I think they might well be bindweeds. But it wouldn't be wise to go looking for them. They might easily take against you and give you a big wart on the end of your nose. Or worse, however, if you are kind to fairies, they will repay you with good deeds. They might even grant you wishes. Well done, Mabe. I think this is an excellent project. Maybe a real fairy helped you. Mrs Horsley. And that is the end of Project Fairy by Jacqueline Wilson. Really hope you enjoyed that story, guys. I will be back soon with lots more stories and videos coming your way very soon. If you'd like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for listening, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.